All right. You want to cut me with that? No. no. Just let me uh, give you this for a minute and get started. Yeah. Yeah. I'd like to welcome everybody to the College of Complexes tonight. Sorry for this slight technical delay. We're getting everything ready. The College of Complexes consists of the following format. First, we have a uh, first we have a brief announcements period. Second, we then have a. Uh, our speaker who will then speak for up to an hour or thereabouts. And then we have a question and answer session where we do ask that you ask questions and not just answer and not give a give a give a speech during that part because after the questions you'll all get a chance to uh, rebut and speak. Yet Mr. Pete, let's welcome tonight to the microphone Mr. Peter Perro and his presentation on classrooms oh, around the world. Let's give him a big hand. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I taught uh, history myself and social studies uh, in, our, in our high schools, but my focus is going to be much more on uh, the college context as, as Europeans see it. And I was, in most cases, talking to you in past years about modernism, Frank Lloyd Wright, uh, talked about shaker uh, buildings and uh, colonial America, but mainly that was exteriors of buildings and architecture, an exterior view. Tonight, I'm, today I'm looking at interiors, uh, specifically classrooms and college classrooms um, from England to Israel, um, looking at uh, some that I have been able to find in a collection at the University of Pittsburgh. And Pittsburgh took it on themselves to gather classrooms from around the world as early as 1926, and room by room in their Cathedral of Learning. And I, I, has anyone been, been to a pit, the campus? Yeah. And I don't mean the Lions or the stadium, but... I attended Fort Pitt. Oh, uh, 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 Pittsburgh, University of Fort Pittsburgh. Pitt. No. <laughs> yeah, good school. Uh, engineering, humanities, history, for, for example, and philosophy, Dr. Bob mentions. A uh, real specialty in the humanities, and uh, my sister's still there trying to finish her degree, but... Uh, it's uh, 1926 that they decided to bring the world to Pitt, uh, to Pittsburgh, and in one of the study towers, and they picked the Gothic as University of Chicago is, in that tower, they were able to put together 23 rooms, and it took uh, through the 30s to build the first set, and they would invite donors from around the world to duplicate college classrooms, their best, when they went to Scotland and asked them to contribute. They got contributions from Edinburgh and other noted, usually private schools in and around the world, as well as the Middle East. Um, so it's not just the Euro-Western tradition, but we'll see tonight, for example, the Chinese tradition. and. Um, the Chinese uh, room at Pitt is the only only room I was able to visit with a round table. In most cases, the Latin-based Western college classroom is usually a professor at the head and uh, graduate students around the seminar table. But the Confucian tradition was much more of a dialogue in the college classroom. And I was surprised it would come out of this and some of the decor that we have. It's nothing like the Western classrooms we'll see in a moment. Um, at the head of the table, there was a carving of Confucius, who was really a philosopher and not a religious figure. And there were precepts that he believed in, of course, filial piety, um, the idea of personal integrity, the idea of, uh, what should I say, uh, intuition and uh, investigation, um, order, rank order in society, sort of the glue that helped build class leaders uh, for China. 
Uh, China still yes, operates very much as a central, central top-down organization today as its economy and political systems put together. But I want to move from there to what Pitt calls the Greek room, and I don't mean fraternities, but elements that you can find and identify yourself. Many Chicago public schools incorporate these kinds of elements uh, on the exterior of the building. I, I'm thinking on this side of town, Sen High School, or what else do we have? Um, oh, in the park there, at the end of Addison. The uh, trade school. Lane yeah. Tech. So it became the cookie cutter <laughs> design for so many Western schools. Uh, the Greek model, the Hellenistic model, or the Athenian model. Uh, the Ionic, Doric, Corinthian style later in Roman times. And so here's the room open to the public. And I happen to ask, you know, would you take my picture? And it's no selfie, I'm beyond that. I said, someone else do it, would you? I'm not going to hold it. So um, one of the ideas we get from the Greeks, who also borrowed from the Egyptians, is this idea of the key. Often you see that in interiors, the key, almost like a skeleton key on its side. And if you go to the Field Museum or the Museum of Science and Industry, you'll see this same sort of design we in, inherited or copied, really, from Greco-Roman times, in this case, Greek. The copper ceiling took a lot of time for the Greeks to put this together, and it was with Greek money. It's with the country's money, not its money, that all these rooms are put together. Um, let's go to, yeah, the Adriatic. And I was surprised with how um, alpine the thing looked. These, these heavy chairs and the carvings. Now remember, these are the 1930s when it's put together. And some of the things are a little tired, a little worn out. And the Yugoslav room was showing where. By the way, um, they hold classes in all these rooms. These are fully functional, so if you're a graduate student, you may have a grad seminar in the choice of uh, the professor for, for his course, or her course. The, um, the carvings were incredible. Uh, leading thinkers from Zagreb and uh, Yugoslav. Yeah, there are many Yugoslav, a lot, a lot of Slavic people in the city of Pittsburgh who came for the steel industry jobs at the turn of the century. At the time, Frick, Henry Clay Frick, Carnegie uh, were able to build those industries. Now it's a very, very different city, more dependent on technology, service industries, medical, medicine, and so on. So Pitt had to go with the times to open a medical school. But I was amazed by some of the Yugoslav panels that were hand-carved. Uh, what do the Russians have to say? Young Syria. Thank you, Doug, for mentioning Syria today. Uh, well, it was the only room that had DVDs free for self-promotion. So they're really proud in giving away these DVDs of their their culture and country. Sense <coughs> of language, uh, Russian language. But um, looking at the seminar table, this is what you would use for your colloquy, a colloquium, I should call it. Um, for your class, or your professor would generally be at the head of the table which is a more Western idea, I found, than a Middle Eastern idea. We'll see in a moment. But here's the professor's chair. Um, could be the throne of Putin, if, if we imagine it up. But um, it's, not the, it's not the premier's uh, chair. It's the professor's. Uh, it's not Putin at all. But um, uh, the, uh, the work they did with plaster makes it look almost lacy to me, very, very fine work to be doing on your back on scaffolding on the ceilings of this room. And I had to give the Russians credit for that. Almost like a handkerchief or a piece of silk, and that's all done with tools cut into plaster above the seminar table in the 1930s. 
these are artisans, these are artists, not uh, what you might say, oh, bricklayer or construction, uh, common construction work about real artisans were sent from the home country. Let's look now at the Middle East and what they were able to export. And again, Syria comes up in the news today. I didn't know those were cruise missiles, by the way. Thank you, Doug. I didn't understand uh, what was happening this week. In They're very smart. Uh, very smart. Uh, a drone with a brain. Uh, but. Here again, very, very different from uh, Western, the Western idea. This is a circle of students. This is really a colloquium room. And almost on the floor, uh, it's hard to separate the uh, professor from the students. So it's a circle. And the idea in Turkey and in Syria, Lebanon, is no one's in the front row ahead of you, and no one's behind you in a classroom. The ideal, the ideal dialogue happens in a circle, searching for some sort of consensus. So if you think you're going to sleep through class, you wouldn't do it in a Syrian or Lebanon classroom. Uh, yeah, it looks like a hookah on the table, so that might contribute to the ambiance. Oh, yeah. One of those. Dolls. One of those uh, water drawn yeah. pipes. That would depend on what they were smoking. Uh, no. And they water also cooled, have, whatever it is. Also have the tea there too. The tea or tobacco. Use. Or 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 the better part yet, the coffee, the Turkish coffee. Oh right, right. You know, see a little samovar set there for. And, and that would be yeah, the Turkish the Turkish coffee to keep the yeah. keep everybody going. Keep everyone churning out ideas. Yeah. I'm the Irish, and we probably got to crack any 20 people in Chicago, you're bound to have two Irish. Uh, no, usually in public meetings, the Irish cheer when they see the fly. Uh, I was fascinated. Rob, Rob, yeah. I'd love it. Um, I, I noticed the uh, wolf head chairs and the carvings, the detail on these carvings, these wolf head chairs. They have a dirt floor. And uh, we got cracks from the peanut gallery back here. That's about the size of The window work is extremely uh, blocky or modern or minimal. It reminds me of one of those Ruol paintings at the Art Institute. So that this is far from Gothic. This is much more advanced and, and uh, Cubist. I was surprised to see it in that room with wolf head chairs, but it worked together. The Austrians. The Austrians, as you know, married, intermarried into royal families, and they said, we don't, we don't gain territory through war in Austria. We gain territory through marriage. A Habsburg princess uh, uh, to another family. And, so Austria gained lots of ground through royal, royal marriages. Uh, a very different feeling from the Middle East, where we were seeing people casually on the floor and discussing. It's very formal. We know who's at the head of the table, usually the professor, not me. And the, book, the books are sort of hidden away or in, in guns in case they're behind glass. Uh, we get a French influence or a Baroque influence with this crystal chandelier. And I think the way it would make me feel is to intimidate me to want to speak up in a classroom as formal as this. But that's the Austrian room, and that's, uh, we'll see it too in the French when we get to there, to that. We're still in the Austrian room, and I thought I'd pick up a chair and see if I could get away with it. And the guides weren't really there to scold us, so I just started moving the furniture. Uh -huh. And uh, then I had to take a break. So the, even, even the ceiling, the coffered ceiling, has this higher order. Oh, you might think of like a box service or an aria going on over your head while you're in, cl in the classroom. The Roman booty, the bait. 
winged children flapping around here, and it's telling the story of angels on high. There's as much time spent on the ceilings, I noticed, than, than as, as on the, the furniture. Um, let's look at the, back to the Middle East and see what's going on. In the Turk room, again, we get simplicity, uh, breaking into modernism. Um, the 1920s look of art moderne um, that at the same time in Paris was taking over the city in, in modern arts. And I was surprised to see Turk, Turk, the Turkish classroom look so unadorned and so um, streamlined. We see it again here. There's an avoidance of stained glass and a more gothic looking heaviness. It's all wood and it's inlaid. So we'll get we'll get a mahogany, we'll get a cedar or or pine, and I definitely again artisans doing all this. This is their idea of this ceiling or what a ceiling should look like, as compared to the Austrian ceiling that looked like something from the Vatican. This is much more simple, and it puts me more at ease. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Muslim. I'll let that question in the twenties they were discouraging Muslim influence because of the uh, Ataturk. Uh, uh, Ataturk, right. He he brought an alphabet to Turkish no, language. What, what Ataturk uh, did was he he was the one who uh, if I'm wrong here, but he was the one who brought the uh, Western influence, tried to get rid of the Muslim influence in government uh, and civil service. That whole so idea. They, yeah. He completely modernized Turkey. Secularizing the society. And if it were, if that was from the twenties, that would reflect a lot of what a lot of his attitude towards what a proper state should be: simplification, uh, you know, modernization. Uh, trying to bring the language too closer to um, uh, moving from Cyrillic to uh, more westernized right. approach to a shorter alphabet, as Korea did after the Korean War in the nineteen fifties came up with Hangul, a more shortened, internationalized version for foreign or loan words. So Kamal did that, yeah, 1928. Kamal Ataturk, considered the, the father of modern Oh, capture the cursor here. Uh, Israel made a contribution by 1980. Mm. And by... In the 80s, Korea also contributed a room. But I wasn't able, it was locked, I wasn't able to get into the Korean room, but I did get into the uh, Israeli room. And very heavy, very somber. I thought more that I was in a religious atmosphere than a secular classroom. <laughs> Pitt says avoid religious symbols and avoid political symbols in the, your room layout. They didn't want in the 1930s to get into swastikas or a political argument or a religious argument. But I think here I feel the weight of Old Testament, Old Testament ideas uh, right here on this wall. We get uh, we get a menorah that almost Egyptian-like creatures at the bottom, reminding me of. Mosaic laws and Bible or Testament stories, I should say, from Hebraic or Torah writings. Very somber, serious. It's not the Austrian room. It's not. Uh, it's not to sit on the floor either here. This idea. The mezuzah was apparent. I almost went out of the room and forgot about that. To, that what's the tradition to? Kiss your hand and touch them with mezuzah. It's a mezuzah. Yeah. Mezuzah. mezuzah. Um, then as I left, I saw it somewhere on this door frame. Well, oh, there. So it wasn't a door hinge, it was a mezuzah. Yeah. Each panel is a commandment of, of the uh, Torah, um, much like Ten Commandments to the Bible, so each in Hebrew is a commandment. And I don't know, probably some of the language classes go on in this room of the, of the cathedral. 
And I wondered what an Indian university classroom would look like. And um, it was very clustered or honeycombed, very, very unadorned brick. They seemed to put more time into furniture. And to my surprise, one, one of the student chairs was carved with a pen knife. And I thought, what, what year did that happen? We've got a very unhappy student here. And it, cuts, it was trying to cut some sort of word or expression about uh, school sucks or something. <laughs> and one of the yeah. chairs. So, that's why you need keys to get into some of these if you visit yourself. You have to ask for a guide and get a key. Have you been there? No, why is it on the right side, though? On the right side? Yeah. That's my cursor there. What? This? The, the, the ketchup bottle in the... In the oh, the yeah, desk. Right here. The desk. Why maybe? That's just... I, it's some kind of goblet. <laughs> <laughs> picture, but my cursor's over it. Here, we have a statue. Here, we have a statue. What room is that? This is the Indian room. Or East, I mean, West Indian, let us say. West Indian. Um, smaller neighbors like Bangladesh, Pakistan were not represented. It takes a lot to ship these materials piece by piece and reassemble them. And so countries with money got attention. Uh, again, simple brick, unadorned, um, but they put a lot in the statuary and the furniture. Now, Charlie, for you, I had a Lithuanian classroom, but somehow it got purged here. I don't know why, but it, it got tossed out. But very fine work, too. Woodwork, hand wood, hand cut in the 30s. Again, Pitt, Pitt is rich in Eastern European uh, residents and workers from the turn of the 19th to 20th. Armenia. Uh, orthodox symbols in the Armenian classroom. And it looks more religious again than secular. If I can go back a step, this student was praying or reading some religious tract out loud, but, but by herself. So students do wander in. This, that was uh, orthodox. Uh, Eastern Orthodox uh, Armenian classroom. And I think we're coming to the cross. Again, those desks were enormous and very, very heavy. Oak shift. Oh, forgot about the Scotch. The Scottish classroom. You have some fan work here cut into this, um, this oak. And it was very fine and evident all over the uh, Scotch, Scott room. One of the uh, symbols of Scotland is the thistle, the crown and thistle. So there it was, in relief, put into uh, stone masonry o over the uh, heads of the students, the ceiling, the, the thorn and sizzle, thistle. Um, some really fine upholstery in this classroom, and the professor's throne uh, in the corner here. Uh, uh, African, I wondered what am I going to see behind that door? And um, the door itself was pretty ornate and mysterious. I wanted to see more about it. Whereas in the Israeli door, we had commandments or excerpts from the Torah. Here we have drawings of creatures and um, Muslim stories. And uh, here the students were using it. I was happy to uh, walk in and students were using it as a study, a study place before the class began. So they were, they told me an hour early to go over their notes for the quiz that day. Uh, but without the students, it's also impressive to see what the African classroom is. It's sort of integrated. You're very, very close and tight with the neighbor to your left and right. Remind me of bus seats on a bus. Uh, 
game part. <laughs> but again, very simple, not highly ornate. Very, very simple, very breaking to modern modernism. Almost deco design. Very simple geometric. And uh, Romanian too, I thought was unusual, but there are many Romanians in the city of Pittsburgh, again, coming for labor, for work. Um, and most of it was woodwork, hand, hand carved. And we get this wise man visiting Jesus motif here. Um, this was woven, woven, and the chairs were crafted. I'm sorry I can't stop for questions, but we will. We will in a moment if, if you have any, so save them, write them down. Uh, the Ukrainian, not to be confused with Russian. We know that. Ukrainian is under the uh, foot of uh, Moscow right now, but especially the Crimean. But much adorned with folk art. I want this. And the idea on the wall was, we're not afraid of new, fresh, foreign ideas, but we lean for comfort on our folk arts, our local art. What? So we had this ceramic stove, on, let me pass them out to mostly for heat, them. not for cooking. You them, you anyway. And let me give them to the people that get them first. Calm down. And cupboards in the back of the classroom it reminded me of an elementary school. So that they're never far from the country kitchen. It surprised me how much hominess there was to a classroom with this Ukrainian, uh, almost barn look to the thing. No hardware, no nails, but mortar, uh, mortise and uh, tenon uh, pegging to the beams. Quite amazing to reconstruct. And we go now, should have had a heading that said the Germans. And the Germans were really high order German here. We got, we've got lots of Baroque again, like the Austrians, with their red ceiling and their glass bookcases. And uh, uh, something about Schiller and Goethe were uh, written on the bottom, and I couldn't come up close enough with the camera to catch it but two, two great world contributors to literature, Schiller and Goethe, and to poetry. Um, I think that about puts us at the close, and we close the door on it, so there we are. So, if you have a chance, and you're ever driving to New York, God help you, about halfway, you could get to Pittsburgh, you could get off, you could ask for a key, and you could see these rooms for free with students there still studying, what? mostly graduate oh, no. students. And I think it's really worth your time because you see 23 cultures with 23 countries as they represent themselves um, in a walk around the Cathedral of Learning, as it's called. So I'll stop with that. It's a world in a tower. And uh, there it is, the Cathedral of Learning, 1926 to the present. Thank you. We're in trouble. We're in trouble. Well, once they close that door, you're you're there. You better stay for the seminar. Dr. Bob. The last review shows that the German one that's the best educated society in the world. Uh, their students are reading philosophers in high school and the hard German philosophers like Kant and Hegel are almost impossible to comprehend. They're, they're studying these in high school in Germany. But um well I don't know about today's one like but they used to not long ago, and then, and then they produced the Nazis. But uh, my question is, um, uh, which environment do you think is best for learning? Well, we were taught in Western education that the Greeks were formative to what, to what we even study today. The notion of math, 
mathematics and higher order math, geometry. But now also the fashion is look before the Greeks, and didn't the Greeks also look to Egypt for some of these things? Um, so I think uh, many of our teachers favored all great ideas starting with the Greeks, but the more I look at the Far East, and I was just in China this uh, March, uh, the more I discover ideas that were sort of kept from me if I didn't find them out for myself. So our history books tend to start with Europe and move forward. But uh, Tim, Tim Bolter. Okay. Yeah, uh, the question I have is, seeing all these classrooms and the various cultures around the world, as well as your own experience with the Chicago Public Schools, what would you consider the best architectural elements that facilitate learning? Yeah, that's a tough, tough um, question, and I thought about it the last couple of weeks. That truly, um, if we look into ourselves, many, many moments of uh, enlightenment could have been spent outdoors or with a relative or family member who turned that light bulb on, and it doesn't necessarily have to be in an or ornate room. And, and uh, when you search yourself for great moments in your life that taught you about things that could have been outdoors with nature, um, we have a Thoreau scholar there uh, talking to me at uh, dinner about Thoreau. But, but really, it can happen anywhere. Vocational education happens on the job. Um, we just sort of, sort of got straightjacketed into the notion that someone who claims to be a specialist Here. will be at the head of the table teaching us about ourselves, really, about, about uh, humanity. And uh, it's top-down learning, but it doesn't have to be in a formal room. For all I said about those rooms, um, it can happen anywhere. And thinkers today like Dewey, well, not today, but John Dewey 100 years ago, mm -hmm. or Maria Montessori 100 years ago, all came to, I think, similar conclusions about experiential learning rather than formal learning. Go ahead, does it relate to it? Go ahead, anyway. Uh, <clears throat> you were telling us that uh, the Romans looked to the Greeks, and the Greeks looked to the Egyptians, but uh, I think that it's important to note, it, to note that the Arabs made big contributions to learning, and one of them was until they made this contribution, no one had the concept of zero. That's not true. And the, the Arabs, true. can I finish please? Oh, the Arabs gave us the concept of zero. No, they didn't. <laughs> Contributions in math. I won't, I won't argue about the idea of zero specifically, but contributions in math, when I think Europeans were still scratching their yeah, uh, heads, wondering oh, yeah, how do we go beyond 10 or, or uh, the digits on our body? How do we go beyond the number 20? Don't forget about the Chinese. So, and the Chinese, on their own, yeah. believed to be center of the universe, <laughs> or the uh, come to me about the, the kingdom, middle kingdom, about the kingdom between heaven and hell. There's the middle kingdom. There's uh, emperor-centered learning from the idea of Confucius forward mm -hmm. uh, of a hierarchy. Right. And, and uh, uh, the Chinese had no uh, formal contact with um, the Greeks or, or uh, Africans at that point. Confucius is 400 years before the time of Christ. Yes? What you can say about Japanese school in 1920, 1930, ah. what the classroom looked like? Very strict, and as Bob Lichtenberg mentioned, they had a choice in the 1920s in Japan, and also after World War II, how will they model their school systems? And admitting some mistakes that led to war, they decided to scrap the education plan and start over again. 
they did choose more from the German model. They thought the American model was too free. The, the Deweyan model or, or Pestalozzi in Italy, uh, they felt there was too much freedom in the American style of education and they favored the Japanese, uh, the German style. Japan, the German, the German style. style. Really? So took ideas and brought consultants from Germany in building the new school system uh, from 1945 forward. And it's very much a drill, 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 drill and kill society. They're very good test takers. I think the American students are better at creative problems, and um, Asians tend to be drilled, drilled, drilled in school for test taking, and it's a make or break sort of test that determines your career um, after graduation from high school because it tracks you into particular colleges that track you into a vocation for 40 years. So it's a make or break, do or die sort of system that still exists in Japan, Korea, and um, in China today. Okay, I'm and it's not for nothing that they're spending a lot of time and money to get into a Harvard or a Yale or a UC Urbana, UIC Urbana. Go ahead. Uh, Andy. Question over here. Okay. Yeah, this, guy, this guy did. You mentioned the Greeks. Uh, they and their architecture, they did not know they had not discovered the arch. The Romans did. But and the dome. And there was the yeah, which is the arch. Yeah. Copper. Um, but there's there's the old saying that a good teacher could teach using a phone book. Yeah. And we also have uh, homeschooling. And those parents take their students to museums and other places well, of interest. Yeah, that's good. And uh, I was out at a conference at North, uh, what was it, NIU, Northeast, uh, Northern Illinois Northern, University. Uh, it was on, on geography, and a parent had. Oh, that's Northeast. Yeah, NIU up in Miguel. Miguel. And a uh, parent was homeschooling and had the boy there. By the way, the professor said, is the one thing I remember. If the ice melted on Antarctica, on Antarctica, it would be, he thought it would be like five islands, not a continent. I'll just throw that out. But what do you, what do you think of uh, global warming? No. <laughs> so, you know, the architecture actually might be a distraction. No, I, I agree with you that the homeschool idea has some merit. And I think your child can learn faster and go further than 30 kids in a classroom are doing down the street. But that important element of socialization isn't there. Getting along with kids from other views, with other views or other backgrounds or economic situations, you're not ready for that until graduation. Then you encounter something really new. And are you ready for the workplace? Well, most homeschool kids do go on to college where they will meet mm -hmm. other kids from other strata and situations. Like they they seem to have yeah. an inner rage being with mom all day, going yeah, not in the school with the other kids. I've yeah. detected yeah, I've seen like an inner rage. Well, My sister right. tried it and gave up after two years. Next question. But it is a trend in America. Now, especially at that pit with uh, Carnegie, who's been very influential in uh, funding a lot of that. Yes, Andrew Carnegie contributed quite a bit to University of Pittsburgh in its early years, just like Rockefeller to U of, U U of C contributed to that chapel. Sure. Too. Got his name on it. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, Carnegie yeah. believed in private endowment, not public. Yeah, I just figured being a Pittsburgh, he would have really been involved there. Yeah, yeah, Carnegie, Carnegie and Mellon too. Um, yeah. All right, I'd like to really know uh, if you had your kid to educate him today, what style would you prefer that he goes? Whether it be like a Montessori school or a traditional one or or some of the other things. What do you think? personally that the best style of education is? I, that is a tough one. You know, who would wish any less than you can possibly 
do for your children for the sake of your sanitary and I need some silver. education. I mean, okay, I'd like to think he can go to the neighborhood school down the block and have the same opportunity everyone else has. But if he excels or if I'm prepared, if I've prepared him well uh, with my wife, he or she will accelerate at her own pace. But unfortunately, if there's distractions and constant um, oh, attention for special ed needs, he will lose some time, and then I'll have to help him make it up through homework, field trips, and all I can do. So I guess like every other parent, I try to send him to IMSA or St. Ignatius or, you know, IMSA's a boarding school. Does anybody know that? And it costs a lot of money, and it, it, it leaves the kid out in the school to eat, sleep, and study at 15 years of age. And it's producing some incredible college uh, material at IMSA. You know, it, 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 it's a boot camp for, for uh, the Ivy League here, and it's out near Aurora. Charlie, in the back, what do you got? Yeah, Peter, I heard you make a disparaging oh, yeah. remark that teaching about European civilization. Do you have an issue with Western culture? And can you show me in what respects you should not teach the achievements? Of what subject field do you think in other cultures? Yeah, I don't, I'm, if I came across to say we cut the Western education, I didn't mean that. I think I got too much of it. I think it was tipped toward what my teachers were taught. And again, that was that all good things, great ideas uh, are Euro-bound or yeah. came from Mediterranean civilization at first. And I think I missed things that I've had to make up for in my own life by going there and finding out to my amazement, well, going to China this past month and finding out things that they never so what teach achievements you did you find out on your trip that it's superior to Western civilization? Superior? Yeah. I think, well, yeah, a thousand mile uh, wall that's 3,000 years old. But forget about engineering. I think they have a knack for subduing their own personal wants and needs to a group and why quality control in the last 30 years has become quality team work teams has become popular and, and and Americans can learn it I think our industries are doing it and doing it well but for many many years it was I'm tired of this this ranch I'm tired of this uh, assembly line and I'm going to sabotage my job, or I'm going to run for the time clock. And we didn't, we, we got our butts kicked by some of those people you think have nothing to teach us, Charlie. About. What I think the better teamwork. The team Chinese work. sculpture are superior to the West. Uh, sculpture? Not, oh, come, may, may I answer that? May I answer that, please? Yeah, yeah go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the, thing, the thing about Chinese culture, is there a little bit more manners and have a little bit more social etiquette than we in the Western things do? And I think that uh, if we could adhere maybe to more of that Chinese tradition here at the college, it might serve us all some good. Etiquette and politeness was the educated gentleman, in addition to things like playing music or connecting music to math and seeing the bridge. It only hurts my ears. So, um, Good. You practice, practice, practice for the Asian student. And yeah. Sometimes it's, it's, it's excruciating, but it does get them places. Right. I've got a two-part question. Yeah. All right. Um, you probably went over this at the beginning, but Louder. you remind me who built this? Who built all the? Charlie. Who built, who built all these classrooms? <laughs> and who funded it? And, and then uh, right. uh, I know what happened in the 20s and 30s there. Right. Remind me who uh, 
Was it their architects from those countries putting the guys uh, together? There are three private universities in Pittsburgh. There's um, Mellon University, which became quite a uh, powerhouse in technology, and some of the basic work for programming went on at Mellon. There's Pitt, and there's Duquesne. Now, Duquesne is Catholic. I'm very big on theology as a department and Latin. But uh, Pitt and Mellon evolved into the hard sciences. Um, they've changed quite a bit. And Pitt has public backing now. But back when the rooms were put together, families like the Mellons, if you know about Mellon Bank, um, the Fricks, if you know about steel, and the Carnegie Corporation funded those rooms. So there's a bias there, yes. And then they talked who actually uh, built those rooms. Each country sent their artisans and craftsmen and materials by boat. Over here. Yeah. What will we do without wood? The filings were gorgeous. The fantastic carvings made out of wood. And uh, oh. I would have cheered many times, but I was eating them. German, Irish, Scottish, Norwegian, French, and English, and you showed some of those. Hey, I touched I that cheered. almost yeah. all. I touched that almost all. your question all. again? Um, what, what will we do without wood? Because the wood carvings are fantastic in those... Uh, what would we do without wood? Yeah. Well, what would we do without wood? For the Europeans, it seemed to lead, they seemed to lean toward woodworking. Yes, beautiful. But in the case of the Israelis, I noticed, or in the case of the uh, Turks, there was even some plastics introduced there in the Turkish room. Those blackish things with the light passing through. But, but it was a Euro tradition that carving the woodwork. And I think in many of these cases, they're not um, talking so much about values, they're talking about product. This is our tradition, this is our folk tradition, and we're going to show it off. It's like an expo that comes every 10 years, like one, the Colombian Exposition. One more thing, other countries often take care of their parents better than we do. We just put them in a nursing home and they don't get taken care of there. Oh, they that, I, you, Charlie, you got a point about the uh, notion of fading because uh, unlike what Confucius said, take care of your parents forever, um, honor the, especially the male eldest, um, now it's fashionable, if you've got the money, to put your parents in a home in um, Japan. A very aging society. And it's something we're going to lose as we block young immigrants from this culture is that we'll have a, a very top-heavy aging society. And um, most of us in uh, homes, uh, uh, nursing homes. We'll be so we, we delegate and sur surrogate a lot of this care, and now it's fashionable or affordable in Japan, Korea, and China to do this. Yeah. Oh, see, that's a pity. Hey, so with the students uh, that you taught toward the end, were they getting more yeah. eager to learn and better able to learn, better prepared? It's mine certainly weren't. They were getting worse every year. <laughs> Uh, but that's been a few years now. But also, um, oh, is there a, what, what, what was the main thing you did, did yourself to instill curiosity in your students, get, getting them, giving them a desire to learn, which is the hardest job in all education? <laughs> I'll tell a story on that. Right. Hit him on the white cane. Uh, right. In one of those sterile classrooms, one of those seminar rooms at UIC, <laughs> And they don't get more stripped down than UIC. It's a, it's a pretty hard surface school to sit in. And I did have the fortune to have a fine teacher that said, discovery is what it's all about. My professor would walk in with a box and he'd say, um, it's something that's good for us all. It's something that's available and free. It's something we should have more of. What's in here? And he said, ask them those kinds of questions to kick off any topic or lecture, and you get more response and interest than to say, turn to page 45 in your science book. And what he had was a pad of grass from a golf course. 
But we as grad students thought, yeah, start with a question, which is, you know, Socratic, Socratic, and challenge them to open that box or to think about what they could put in a box when they become teachers. So he was terrific. He was old school, but he asked the right questions, and it, he made me want to be a teacher for 25 years. But it's tough. I compete against technology today, and that's very tough. Okay, uh, give me one three second. Three quick points. I, I see the campus designed by Mies van Roa. Yeah. Very Spartan, glass and steel. Uh, somebody yeah. mentioned wood. The lumber companies are, are looking for uses of wood because of the uh, lack of the use of paper with uh, internet and emailing. And I mentioned, I mentioned yeah. a phone book. If anybody wants to know what that is, you can look it up on Google. Teaching out of the phone book. <laughs> <All right. laughs> you know, I worked with some adults this week, and, and uh, we used the phone book. Why? Because they're immigrant students, and we were talking about Thank you, dear. English alphabetization. So I gave them a bunch of random stores and address, uh, families, and I said, find those in this phone book. You've got six minutes, and um, I want to know the page numbers in six minutes. Well, what I was teaching them to do was find information, but what they did very, very readily was team up. They said, well, you take the stores, I'll take the families. And I thought, terrific. This is what I mean by Asian cooperation, because most of the kids were Asian. And it was a fun exercise. By the way, that with wood, they can build eight or ten story buildings now. Strength in wood. Ginny Gang, the architect in oh, Chicago. Gang. By the way, she's going to be at the University of Chicago three times. Uh, you can look it up. You will see Thank events you. and uh, Thank you so much. You know, she's very highly regarded. But, we'll see Jean uh, Gang if you get a chance. That, that she likes to give free talks. She did that aqua building downtown. Right. She did, uh, <coughs> okay, when you mentioned the melons, they didn't only control the melon bank, you forgot about Gulf Oil. Gulf Oil and Pittsburgh, yeah. They ran this too. Did the melons own Gulf? Start Gulf? Yeah. Yeah. Richard yeah. King Melon. And then, of course, he gave money back to the arts. And oh, yes, Alcoa, they, that was theirs also. Right. That was theirs. Okay. okay. Uh, uh, two, two important things that got Pittsburgh off the ground in the night after World War II was um, Gulf Oil and Alcoa Aluminum. And by the way, when you get on this tariff list that um, Trump has right now, right at the top of the list, he wants um, to put duties on steel, aluminum, and solar panels, and he thinks China's cheating on those three items. He thinks so. But then China retaliates on our ag business. So ConAgra and uh, Archer Daniel Midland is having a fit and telling Trump, you start with uh, three things you want to tariff, and it'll come back and bite us, and three things we make will be tariffed by the Chinese. The Chinese are griping right now about the um, big agribusiness and how they're going to uh, tariff grain. But I digress. Corn and grain. Um, are you familiar with the, uh, since you're familiar with school design and economics and, and, and all this, are you familiar with the work of Richard Florida and his city planning called structures? Um, Richard, I'll, 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 I'll explain. I heard about TED Talks and that he's on, on YouTube a lot. That's all I know. I'll explain it in the rebuttal period then. Okay, hold that. His name is Richard Florida, um, cutting edge thinker today. He's in demand at a lot of campuses, but and I'll the, let Tim explain it. If you guys are running out of questions, uh, we can go to rebuttals a little bit yeah. sooner and you can have a little more time to Let's express do that your then. thoughts if, if that appeals to anybody. Yes. Uh, Jonathan back there. We got, still got a couple more here. Who hasn't? Who hasn't? Who hasn't had a question yet? Get up and say it. Uh, did you find any classrooms that were uh, either seasonally or all year round outdoors? And how did that dynamic affect the curriculum? Well, a great idea. Um, of course, in the Northeast, as we are, and the Midwest, yeah, we, we would be buried. But there's no reason in the um, temperate climates where they can't spend half the year 
outdoors. I'm outdoors. thinking of a place like Brazil yeah. that uh, does agri research. And ConAgri is there too, and Archer Daniel trying to uh, put partnerships together with Brazil and Argentina. And I mention those two companies because they're powerhouses in Chicago. Who else? Back here. Yeah, there, <clears throat> there wasn't anything to do with Native Americans in that. Is it, uh, the, does, do they exclude North you. America? Thank you. They have not come forward to put a room there. And in Carnegie's day, probably they were not invited, but now the university would be willing. And right off, I think about the Turkish room and the Syrian room and the notion of the circle as a place to learn, not not a seminar table with the professor or the chief at the head. So that would come out. Hogan's, tents, that sort of place of learning. It doesn't have to be a Baroque inspiring room that looks like Symphony Hall. And I bet that would come out in the Native American learning space. I got a question. Andy Anderson. In all your travels, have you uh, gone to a great educational uh, landmark that's north of Lexington, Kentucky, called the Creation Museum and Noah's Ark? There's a full-size replica of Noah's Ark, and then the Creation Museum is 20 miles north, and they show everything that the Earth was created 6,000 years ago. Well, I've seen a lot of criticism on that um, because scientists debunked that. Have you visited? Say, no, I haven't walked into that, um, what is it called? The Creation Museum. Creation Museum, South of Cincinnati. All right, creationists, and then you know. Two football fields, Noah's Ark. It's two football fields long, seven stories high. It's actually a pretty neat place. My, my pastor says it's a neat place. He went there last summer, and he said, uh, I don't exactly believe in a lot of this stuff because the Bible can be interpreted some different ways, but he said, Whoever put the money up on that thing's really making it, really getting some questions out there for people to ponder. They have God behind them. <laughs> well, we do have a place like that called Hollywood, too. No! Do you have one more question here? Yeah. Have, you, have any great leaders come from those classrooms you showed today? No, I think they weren't. They were looking down the center line saying, this is what we do in classic education in our country. The contributors. They weren't saying uh, Margaret Thatcher attended this this room or that that school. They weren't talking did about you, things like that. Did you talk to the Merkel. students that were in that room where they were kind of close together? Yeah, they did like uh, <coughs> to study together in those rooms. It was sort of a cave, like a secret environment. So they seemed very comfortable with that. Happy to be there. Last question, if you don't mind. What was your favorite room? Why are we oh. rushing? No, Charlie's got one. Why are we rushing out of questions? We're I'd not like rushing. To, at 7.30. You already had one. Everybody's just hey, look, like, since I have one. That's why I said Why are we cutting off questions at 7.30? We're not cutting off anybody's question. I just mentioned well, he just people did. Want, people want more time to read. You had one. They can have it. We got a lot of people here tonight. Might want to talk. Wasn't there a question over here? <laughs> I thought Charlie had one. Did get a question or not? Good. Go ahead and ask, Charlie. What kind of chair is this? We got a question? Reminds me of Judge Judy's show. Uh, Ooh, right there yeah. in the best. Um, are these classrooms used for classes, or is yeah. it strictly a museum? No, it's a living it's a place. Living? They want okay. it to be a classroom daily. Mm -hmm. yeah. And where they teach liberal arts courses mostly? Yeah, mostly their languages. Languages, okay. Humanities, the liberal arts. No labs. Well, we got a question here, right? Go ahead. What about the way the desks are designed? Your thoughts on that? The way what are desks? Oh, I am interested. I, I've got a whole show. God forbid I come here and do it, but. On chairs, chair design over a hundred years, and um, you know they're awful. I mean, they're really contortionist in that they're hardwood. They're not cushioned. Um, they assume everyone's right-handed. These pallet desks, 
and I just thought they were awful. And most of the buildings and rooms, I, I mean, in the building were were like that, except when I when I looked at the Turkish, the uh, Syrian, the Chinese, had the round desk at least, and there were some variations. This is what I mean about not learning enough about exceptions to the Western rule when I went to grade school. Well, that was 40 years ago, but I did not learn there were other ways to do things. Not even Native American ways. Mm -hmm. So, over here again. Uh, Frank Lloyd Wright designed a whole campus in uh, Lakeland, Florida, Florida Southern College. The original 12 buildings were Frank Lloyd Wright designed. They've restored them in recent years. Great place to visit, Lakeland, Florida. Ah, uh, he designed a college, he said. Yep. Four-year college in Florida. But wasn't that one in Arizona, too? The whole th that's Taliesin. That's, that's Taliesin. Summer House. I did not see the Florida uh, college, but I found an elementary school for girls in Tokyo. Uh, I read about it and I took trains until I found it. By trains, I mean elevated trains in Tokyo to find this thing. It was pretty deteriorated and it, I felt terrible that the Japanese didn't realize how great he was to put that elementary school together. He called it School of the Arts for Girls and it was a private school, but it was deteriorating. The ceiling was falling and, and I got to it just in time to get pictures. Wasn't he an so Wright was really an international visionary. Wasn't he an, an architect in Japan early in his career? And there's a big Japanese influence in his yeah. architecture. If you Wright really collected uh, scrolls and yeah. prints. And they did influence him quite a bit. He liked screens in the house rather than solid walls. He liked screens, the idea of rice paper for windows and that sort of thing. Okay. Yeah. All right. Chicago's favorite son. One. Right. And All he right. also designed the Imperial Hotel, which has since been torn down, but which withstood was one of the only buildings in Tokyo that withstood the big 1923 earthquake. All right, David. He said he designed a hotel that withstood the uh, Tokyo earthquake of uh, All right. 12. 23. You had a 23. Okay. You had a question over here, Peter. And they rebuilt a piece of it. Question over here. I was going to say, these classrooms you showed were very good, I thought, for, for the art, the architecture map, but uh, do you think that these represent average classrooms or normal classrooms? I don't, I don't think these rooms represent what a country student would attend, but, but, but that's when we think of high school. I think typically as an urban university, that's the kind of room we got to see. Well, that's true. And, a, and most of them private. Right. Who would, uh, to take a second out, uh, who would like to give a rebuttal tonight? Let's get a feel for how many people want to get up here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, probably ten or more. Right. Uh, well, if we got at least ten Good. or twelve people. Let's, Let's get, get started on rebuttals now because we're going to go past 8.30 with all these people. So uh, give our speaker a hand tonight. Can you turn the lectern forward and get your laptop off? Help! Straighten out the lectern and get his laptop. Just put it on the... On the, on the and then I just set it on there. A lot of opinions can... Okay, uh, again, uh, raise your hands and we'll get a hand. Hands out of this table. Uh, anybody that wants to give a rebuttal? One, two, three, they got, they got one. Four, five. Okay, uh, we'll start with four minutes. Now we can go five. You want to go four? Watch four. Go four. Okay. Trust me, people will come up here right All right, four right. minutes. Jonathan. Jonathan. Who John. wants to go first? Jonathan. 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 Jonathan, go. They're up there. Okay, over there. 
Before enlightenment, carry water, chop wood. After enlightenment, carry water, chop wood. Uh, this Zen proverb uh, talks about something that, uh, you know, for a lot of us, uh, no matter what part of planet Earth we're on, this has a lot to do with uh, how well we understand this proverb as uh, what was our earliest experience uh, with learning, with asking questions, with being curious, with trying to uh, grasp, we're at the College of Complexes, complex concepts and ideas. Um, the best teachers uh, I ever knew will tell you, you inspire the student to learn. There's really very little teaching going on. You're facilitating someone else's curiosity to self-motivating their learning engine. So uh, a teacher has an incredible responsibility to do all this hard work that then you uh, surrender your hard work to the student and let the student carry that baton over the finish line. And uh, I remember my high school social studies teacher, uh, a little short uh, lady named Mrs. Pierce at Wilbrook High School with curly brown hair and, and, and dark glasses. Uh, very unassuming lady if you saw her walking down the street uh, to the grocery store, but when she got in that social studies uh, classroom, uh, you remembered it because she made you empowered and have a, a self-generated uh, appreciation for knowledge. And Peter, I, I love your uh, uh, way that you talk about the aspects that we don't always uh, think about. It's not always about the textbooks and the amount of money uh, the school district has in its budget. Uh, you create an environment where you free up the human uh, mind, the human imagination. And uh, that's something that each culture uh, has its own original uh, stamp on. But there are some universal themes that run through it. You save a student, you save a world. You teach a student, you teach for the world. Your patient shapes a future. Bless you, boy, bless you, girl. Bless you, boy, bless you, girl. You save a future, you t take away the hurt. You guide our future, you harmonize away the tears that burn. Your graciousness is first. You bring us strength to return to our roots. You raise a student, you raise a world. You mentor a student, you mentor a student. Your patience raises a future. Bless you, mom, bless you, dad. Bless you, mom, bless you, dad. You raise a future, you, it takes years to learn. To raise a future, it takes years to learn. You always put us first, and we thank you for that. Yes, we thank you for that. How we bloom, how we bloom, how we bloom. And how all of us bloom, all the world thanks you. How we bloom, how we bloom, how we bloom. Thank you, Peter. Okay. Yay! Oh, all right, Jonathan. Yay. All right, Jonathan. Yay. Next. Yay. Next. Yay. 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 Yeah, it's so I have nothing to uh, rebut against the uh, main speaker, but I do have something to rebut against the first speaker. Andy uh, got up and talked about Trump, which, well, I agree with a lot of what he said. But he also mentioned 9-11 again in the past. He talked about it. And uh, I thought, well, I think I'll rebut some of that. I actually took the time to go online and look up some of the things that he'd been talking about in the past about 9-11, uh, specifically about Building 7, uh, which was standing after the collapse of the two main towers. And he was, the claim is that it was brought down by explosive controlled demolition. Um, some of the things that he claimed was, um, well, it was standing after the main tower uh, collapsed. Um, the, uh, that uh, it couldn't have been brought down by a fire because no building has ever been brought down by a fire. All the firemen were pulled out in advance. Nobody was killed in that collapse. And it was even reported as having collapsed before the collapse. So a lot of that, well, there seemed kind of little rings of truth in there. So I just did some research online. 
Um, so to start off, basically, you had Tower 7 is 45 stories tall. Tower 1 is 100 stories tall, and it's right next to it. So the way they explained it online is that uh, they use the phrase ejected material. <laughs> so you have all this material from a completely collapsed underground story building falling on Tower 7. If you look at photos, which are online everywhere, this material took out the corner of Tower 7 from floor 7 to 17. The corner is it's just not there. And up about floor 40, the whole side of the building is missing. So the structural integrity was really damaged. In addition, the ejected material had um, uh, damaged the sprinkler system. The sprinkler system was designed with some main risers. You take out those risers, and it just destroys the sprinkler system. You destroy the gas system. That's the cause of a lot of the fires. So you have this out of control fire going and uh, a structural integrity is destroyed. Um, also, um, the idea of explosives taking out the building, it would need thousands of pounds of explosives. It, for, for controlled demolitions, they use thousands of pounds of explosives, and it takes a week or more to set up these explosives around all these piers, these pilings. <coughs> There's no way you can do that without the workers seeing guys coming in planning all this stuff around the pilings. Um, it would take weeks of work and you have all these witnesses and there's no witnesses that have come forward and complained about the strange doings the week before 9-11. Uh, um, also, the fire department which was watching the building saw the building start to bulge. So. Uh, they actually predicted, they said that the collapse was impending, they pulled out the firemen out, they reported it to the news pe people, the problem was that one person from the BBC heard the report wrong and thought the building had already collapsed and she made the mistake of reporting the collapse before it had actually happened. Um, and then finally there was, there actually was a building that collapsed solely from fire damage where the fire, the raging fire, weakened the steel structurally to the point where it collapsed. It was a really bad fire in Tehran. This actually happened after 9-11. Um, but it was a complete destruction of the building. So those are things I found out. I thought I'd share them with you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. All right. All right. All right. All right, first of all, a quick moment of silence for the lady that died in the dampers yeah, last week. I thought that was a very sad situation, so I'm sorry for her. Dampers has one of my patrons. Um, a very nice presentation, Peter. Very nice. And, um, Gives me another reason to visit Pittsburgh. Not only you could still you could even ride the inclines on the side of the yeah, right. It's a nice town. It's I I call it the San Francisco of the East. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so yeah, inclines and all these uh, classrooms would be very interesting to see. So uh, what do these classrooms have to do with Facebook? You ask. <laughs> I can make a transition too, I guess. Facebook, excuse me. I'm working too. I'm working my brain. Okay, so uh, anyway, so yes, Facebook was on display this week in our government. Uh, classrooms, I, um, you know, classrooms and free speech and everything are under attack by corporations, by big media, by big Trump, by big Republicans, by whatever. They, do not want people to know anything. They do not want people to be educated. They don't want free speech. Ernie, where are you going? <laughs> anyway. Okay. So anyway, Facebook was uh, exposed. And he, you know what? People don't have to put any personal information on Facebook. I don't. And I've been on there for eight years. And you know, Facebook and Russians and Republicans and Trump could go see everything they want about me. By the way, Facebook's a nice democratic free speech forum like this, whereas Twitter is an authoritarian 
type of social media. It's perfect for a president that wants to get his message out to 50, 100 million people without any feedback. So Twitter sucks, okay? Facebook, at least it's a forum where you get to have feedback. But here's the real reason that Facebook is being trashed and the media doesn't like them and the Republicans, whoever, nobody likes them because it makes people think, it makes people react and respond and converts. The real reason is big media hates Facebook. Big media realize that more and more people are going to Facebook for their news, for information, for conversation. And big media doesn't like that. They want people going to them. You get that? They don't want Facebook. So whenever you see Facebook being trashed, education, free speech, it's un-American, okay? So just take that away from tonight. Don't let these people take Facebook away from it. Yes, Charlie, got a All question? All the big media newspapers have Facebook pages and publish their articles. Right. So why are you saying they would be avoiding it? They don't like Facebook, is what I said. Why? Because they're taking market share, they're taking eyeballs, they're taking... Eyeballs. They're reading that same article. All right, let's... Anyway, it's, a very, it's very democratic, it's free speech, Facebook, and classrooms, and... All right. Beware. As usual, such message has said nothing. You always give me a hard time. <laughs> Guys, I give you a hard time. Who's today? I hope. <laughs> I don't know. We have the United, United States. Recognize the United States. Recognize the United States. Recognize the United States. Attacking Syria from the uh, different areas in the world to their ships and things and their missiles. And they, they say Syria has been using these. Chemical warfare against innocent civilians. It was supposed to be people coming in today into Syria and checking it out. But these countries use these missiles already. And if we look at the history of the United States, in Vietnam, for instance, we used ancient orange for defoliation and it killed a lot of people. And it's a chemical weapon. It uses dioxin in the making of ancient orange. And that was chemical warfare. If you look at Yugoslavia, where the United States came in, in the 1990s, under, under Clinton, what did we have then? We had depleted uranium being used on the people there. And there's a nurse where I live, and we were talking about that, and she says she would never vote for Clinton. I said, why not? She says, many, a lot of people in Yugoslavia have all kinds of brain disorders and all kinds of illnesses because of depleted uranium being used on those people. And then we had an eight-year war between Iraq and Iran. And the United States gave information where they could use their chemical weapons against Iran in this eight-year war. So all this is a lot of BS that we're getting. We're not getting any truth. What we're getting is another rationale for war. That's what we're getting. And we want what we're after. We're after Russia. We're after China. We were in seven different wars in the Middle East. And the United States can't live without wars. For instance, if you go and buy a car, what happens is once in a while you got to bring it in to be fixed. But you're not going to buy a car every three months or every six months. 
But if you take weaponry, it gets destroyed real fast, and it makes for super profits for the corporations. And that's what we're getting. So if you start believing what the mass media and their lackeys tell you, then you're going to be brainwashed by the United States. It's all a great big hoax to make for profits. Thank you. All right. All right. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank our speaker for a, a very well-researched uh, talk, uh, a lot of good pictures and stuff. You put a lot of effort into it, and it was interesting. Uh, my main interest, actually, was the discussion that followed regarding the educational systems. Of course, the architecture tells you a little bit about the educational philosophy and systems. But I guess the main point I would like to make, I believe that the European schools and probably many other places in the world are better than the American schools, but that has more to do with the culture uh, than it has to do with uh, anything else. I think they're more disciplined, they're more rigorous, and so on and so forth. Now, I went to European schools, to high school, this was oh, a couple of years ago, probably more than 20 years ago, that I went to high school uh, over there. and. Uh, found it to be much more rigorous, uh, came over here, managed to enter college a year early, and a lot of the courses I'd taken as a junior over there, uh, I didn't get to that level of material until a sophomore in college. Now, I think the U.S. schools have been much more, become much more rigorous. They have more advanced material now, opportunities for kids who really have an interest in, in uh, uh, more advanced mathematics and science and so forth. Uh, you can get it now. But the biggest difference, I think, is something we, we are just kind of toying with over here. In a lot of the European systems, they do what we call tracking here. And tracking over here is considered a bad word, but it's, it's part of the system over there. They take kids who, who are geared toward a, a college type uh, of future with uh, engineering and other fields such as that and, and separate them from the kids who are probably going to be doing uh, trade type uh, careers and as a result particularly in Germany as a result Germany has some of the best engineers of any place in the world but they also have some of the best technicians because they put a lot of dignity and a lot of effort into the people who aren't going to go to college and learning how uh, to to be excellent technicians carpenters plumbers etc 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 in any case that's my opinion one other uh, thing just a little observation uh, about European versus American schools, uh, private schools in particular. In, uh, in this country, the people who have the means will sometimes send their kids to private schools because they believe they get a better education uh, than they do in the public schools. In Europe, typically, the people who have the means will take their kids who, who don't make it to the college track in the public schools and send them to private schools because they don't want them to be plumbers or carpenters or something else. They want them to have an opportunity to go to college, which they might not have in the public schools. Thank you. All right. All right. Go ahead. Hello. Um, as a former teacher, I, uh, I think children could probably learn in almost any atmosphere as long as it isn't full of stress. Uh, I, about 10 years ago, I had the opportunity of going to Africa, to Tunisia and Kenya on an African safari. And while we were there at the tourists, we, we uh, visited a school that the, um, one of the tribes were going to at the time. And the school was round, like our speaker talked about, and the children's desks were dirt floors, and their tables were pads, wooden planks on their laps, and they sat um, Indian style around uh, in, in the circle. And they had, were having a good day because this particular day, they were um, coloring from pages torn out of a coloring book with a set of crayons for each four child, four children. 
And I thought, oh boy, this is really something. So I went up to one, the, the, the teacher said, go up and talk to them and they'll be there. Well, these were African children. I didn't know what they could do. So I saw a, a group of about four, seven or eight year olds, I'd say they were, sitting in a circle and they were coloring balloons. And I went, like most great teachers would do, I went, oh, balloon, are you making a balloon? And the boy looked at me and he frowned and he kind of went, and I said, yeah, a balloon, you know, are you? and he said, looked at me and he scratched his head and he said, what's the matter with you lady? Don't you know how to speak English? <laughs> and I, I was, you know, of course, taken back by that. And the teacher said, these children speak not one but three languages. She said, we usually write in dirt on the floor. She said, but we do speak three languages. We speak English because that's the uh, world uh, language and we speak Swahili and that's the language of our country. And we also speak uh, our own dialect and can understand many others because there's 114 of those between the tribes. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was a good lesson for me. You can learn if you are got the right atmosphere. Right. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you, Pete, for bringing that uh, bit of culture into this uh, body here. Um, um, it is called College of Complexes, so it is very appropriate. Uh, appreciated the uh, um, seeing these things, and uh, especially it was, you know, uh, to focus on Syria, as there were a couple of Syrian connections, as you pointed out, and I had mentioned in the, uh, uh, the beginning of, in the announcements, uh, and it's on everyone's mind about the, um, the attack, uh, which is some kind of contrivance, of course. I think we all see through that. It's a distraction. It's a wag a dog uh, thing. Um, and it's just causing destruction. And as I pointed out, uh, uh, could possibly cause environmental damage by releasing these chemicals, these so-called chemical weapons. And in any case, uh, as was pointed out by another uh, esteemed speaker here, uh, I was going to bring that up about the depleted uranium and uh, the use of chemical weapons by the United States, including, you know, napalm and um, and Asian orange and and uh, you know and depleted uranium, of course, is a terrible thing which ruined Iraq. It's just all over the place. It is, of course, uh, slightly radioactive, but it, it, it's, they take they take out the uranium-235 that's used for really horrible weapons, nuclear weapons, and they leave the uranium-238. And because it's so very dense, they can use it uh, for these uh, uh, armor-penetrating um, uh, rounds that they fire. And, but uh, the, the stuff gets all over, got out all over Iraq and caused a lot of uh, damage. And that's a chemical weapon, really. I mean. So the United States is so guilty, and here we see these hypocrites like uh, Nikki Haley and Trump acting so um, uh, holier than thou. <laughs> How can Trump be holier than anybody? But, uh, he's about the same as Assad, except that uh, uh, we haven't gotten to the point where he would use chemical weapons on us. But I suppose that could come to it could come to that point by the year 20. Um, 19 or 2020. I mean, we don't know what's going to happen. Um, it's good to reflect on the fact that we did see these examples of Syrian culture, and Syria uh, is a region um, that uh, was celebrated in the ancient age. In fact, uh, civilization might have started there. Gobekli Tepe uh, is an extremely ancient site, something like 10,000 years old. That's in Syria. And it's kind of been destroyed because of the civil war. It's a, a tremendous tragedy. And the United States is partly responsible for this, um, with the, um, you know, but particularly with the destruction of Iraq and the antiquities lost there. But uh, you know that spilled over to Syria. I mean, ISIS is of course the creation of the United States. So unfortunately, it goes back to George W. Bush just destroying Iraq. So the United States is so guilty of so many uh, foul deeds, and uh, we have to hope that we do not disintegrate into the you know, civil war that Syria had. Um, we must get rid of the fascists and the warmongers. We must root them out of our society. And we must certainly get them out of the top of our society where they're creating so much havoc. Okay. Mr. Travis.
Four minutes. I would like to say uh, that our uh, speaker left something out about the University of Pittsburgh. When they built the Cathedral of Learning in Pittsburgh, uh, they had a building fund. And so they technically never finished building the Cathedral of Learning so they could continue to get donations and contributions. And this was considered to be a very clever idea. <clears throat> I, uh, our speaker didn't mention that, but I thought it was something that was applicable. <clears throat> I want to tell a quick story about public education. When I was a kid, I went to public school, and um, I had a teacher named Miss Bolger. And uh, Miss Bolger would come into the class right after lunch, and I would walk over to her desk and I would say, Miss Bolger, may I please go to the bathroom? And first of all, this woman talked like a parrot. <laughs> and so when I would ask her that, she would say, Confound you, lazy, good-for-nothing brat! <laughs> so then I would say, well, then can I go get a drink of water? And she'd say, go sit down! Now this same teacher used to say, take a good look at this boy, class. He's the only one who's going to get the electric chair before he's 21. <laughs> uh, well, I didn't get the electric chair, and I'm still here. But I used to have a fantasy about Miss Bolger, because the way she would move her hands and talk, it, it gave you the distinct impression that she should have been smoking a cigar. <laughs> you know the kind that you uh, you bite the piece off and spit, and then you you light the cigar. She seemed to be going through a motion like that. Well, Miss Bolger was a very, very evil person, and that sort of treatment would never be tolerated today. No. Now I had teachers that would grab kids by their neck and shake them back and forth till, their, till they felt like their brain came loose. And uh, I had other teachers that would shout in your ear and practically make you deaf. Incidentally, I still have trouble with my hearing today. Uh, and I believe it's from that. Uh, if you want your kids to be, oh, and there was another thing Miss Bolger used to like to say to me. I know a juvenile delinquent when I see him. <laughs> well, if you want your kids to grow up to be drug addicts and uh, 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 juvenile delinquents and, and to be bums and so forth, send them to public school. They will accommodate that greatly. Uh, the, the worst possible place anyone could send their children to would be a public school. I spit on the public school system. Thank you. <laughs> All right. All right, let's uh there to the counterpoint. I would like to thank Peter for a very excellent and stimulating presentation. Louder. I would like to thank Peter for a very excellent and stimulating presentation. With regard to the comments that were made about capitalist lackeys and this, that, and the other thing, I would say simply that the speaker needs to be reminded that Stalin died in 1950, that's number one. And that communism fell in the Soviet Union in 1991. Thank you. Hi, my name is Ellen. Um, I was going to write some, down some notes about what I was going to say, but I didn't have time, so I'm just going to kind of wing it. Uh, first of all, I'm sorry that you had such a... I got teachers I'm sorry, uh, what's your name again? Uh, David. 
David, I'm sorry you had such a horrible teacher. I mean, that, you know, she, she was like a sociopath. And, um, and that is one of the problems, you know, I see with schools is a lack of accountability sometimes for, I mean, I remember, I think I only had maybe one really nasty teacher. You know, I had a really nasty teacher in fourth grade. I don't remember it that much, but you know, it, it can be really bad for children's mental health probably to have very nasty um, uh, teachers like that. Um, I, one of the biggest problems I saw when I was growing up in schools and I grew up in a public school, um, this is what was before Columbine, um, is that just tremendous amount of bullying and nastiness. Okay. And um, I don't know whether that's being addressed anymore. But that's you know a serious detriment um, to children and, and their their psychological health and also their academic health because if they're being bullied all the time, they're not going to be learning as well. Um, and well, yes, but the, you know you, you can't just say well it's been going on forever so we can't do anything about it. I, I challenge. Wait, wait, wait! It's my time to talk, please, sir, ma'am. It's my turn to talk, so please let me talk. You can talk afterwards, okay? Um, yeah. I, um, one thing that should be done is that I don't believe there should be really big class sizes. Now that's something that goes that um, the Oklahoma. Um, teachers are striking about. They have these classes with 35 students. I mean, you have to understand when children are little, they're just like learning right from wrong. They're just learning how to treat each other decently. You know, you can't just, you know, have huge numbers um, in class without, without control. Um, one of my siblings was really bullied so much um, that my parents pulled her out of public school for junior high and put her in a private Catholic, um, maybe it was an all-girls um, school, and there was, supposedly it was much better over there. Um, and to be honest, I think I would have benefited from going to that school too, because I was bullied all the time growing up as well. Um, also another issue I see is that um, kids aren't necessarily treated as individuals, you know, and, and treated with compassion as individuals. Um, I see that. Um, as another problem, um, something which I don't know that I had too big of an issue with, but I hear um, people talk about is, you know, these, these classrooms, um, like I was listening to somebody talk about schools um, just this last Thursday. Um, he has this um, website, whatschoolscouldbe.org, I believe, and um, I didn't we didn't, me and my friend didn't agree with everything that he said, but he said like in the poorer schools, they tend to give all these worksheets and they're really boring and then that kids end up less engaged and so they give more uh, worksheets and then they're more disengaged and it's kind of cyclical and then some of them drop out and, and things of that nature and that what kids need is, um, you know, to have, um, a school with, you know, assignments or classrooms with meaning and purpose. Um, I think this this would be really great. So the, get them get them involved in important things. Get them, you know, developing expertise in things and um, get them involved with things that are meaningful, important, and, and maybe they'll be less concerned about superficial things. Thank I just wanted to clarify something. Hold on, I just wanted to clarify something. You know, the reason I, the reason I made a point about the lady getting killed is that I wanted the people in this group to be safe in the parking lot. And she was run over by a gas guzzling SUV, by the way. So I just wanted the people to be safe. And, but, she was a patron, she was a customer here. She's not a... 
Okay. And back in the day, you needed a nun, Sister Jean and nuns to keep you in shape. I had a science teacher in grade school that had a three foot long yardstick, and he would slap your desk, and he was about, he was a blind man for Texas. Thank you. And then you tried to get it. Yeah, hey, you do it at shape. your case, kids with a whip. No. What happened last week was there was a lady killed by a driver who made a mistake. Uh, and she was over, so was a lady. She, uh, she wound up. Uh, what happened? It was an older man. He was pulling into the third parking, handicapped parking spot. She just got her 96 year old mother into the passenger side and was walking around the car to get in. She was 76. The guy made a wide turn. He was in a big suburban. He hit a target cart. Didn't know what he hit, panicked, and went to slam on the brakes and instead slammed on the accelerator and killed her and the mother. They had to pry her out of the car. And I think, I think what we're trying to say is, I think that our whole group feels for something like that happening. And be careful. You know, yeah. sometimes a moment of silence might be very apropos to what happened. So in lieu of that, we'll just have a brief moment. And let's hope that all of us will take proper precautions out there ourselves. Thank you, Heather, very much for clarifying. Now, okay, in uh, regards to uh, teaching kids, Ellen, it would be very nice to have all that in there, but there's a little something called money, a little something called tax dollars, and a little something called the will of the people to achieve something like that. Yes, we'd all like to have great schools. We'd all like to have great stuff, but if we're not willing to pay for them, there are tax dollars, then we're not going to have them. All right, I promised you a little bit on Richard Florida. Richard Florida was a professor, an economist, and, and an economist, and he's been around for years. He talks about the arts component of a capitalist economy, and he talks about it being very essential for the building of a, of a, of a modern economy. And he says jobs are shifting more towards an arts component rather than the manufacturing slash engineering component. For example, if you're a dentist and you are you can be a plain vanilla dentist, but say you have a little bit of marketing in your uh, business to help you prosper even more, that's where the arts component comes in. Say, for example, you get your kids to the dentist and he has a little seminar to teach them how to brush better. That's something he could offer as an extra service. Um, say you're an interior designer for buildings and you're near larger corporations, you're going to tend to cluster around a, a city that has a lot of the larger corporations in it. He also says that cities tend to specialize. And he said the web is not getting people out all over the world and coming in, but they're getting a lot more spiky than we used to. You go to Nashville to learn about the music scene. You go to New York to learn about finance. You go to San Francisco to be a startup. And he says a lot more of that's coming in. The big thing for him though is he says for a city to prosper and to really get in there, you need a arts community which he says it requires the gays, the LGBTQs, the Christians, and a tolerant <coughs> atmosphere involved for other points of view and other lifestyles. In other words, he's saying that there's a, a level of tolerance. And he said you have to have uh, some young people as well as older people in a good mix. He thinks that most cities out in like the Midwest are lacking in young single people sticking around long enough to create that arts component. And he said that's why a lot of the smaller towns are not prospering like they should, is because they don't have an art scene. He said the best thing that a small town could do would be to donate some buildings in their downtown district to some artists' lofts so they can get a painting scene and a little bit of a music scene going and just some stores that could get the arts component going. Um, he said that there's about a 20 to 30% return on investment 
when you do this. It was kind of shocking to me to hear about the creativity that's sponsored by the arts, but as Richard Florida has some data to back him up. If you've never took a look at it, um, I think there's about three books that he's written. You can Google them and look them up. The names, I've read all three. They're not, I, I'm forgetting their names, but the whole idea is that you need an arts component. You need a, a structure or a liberal arts component to the training of managers and people in order to really have a thriving economy. Thriving economy is about people. It is about improving people's lives. It is about buying and selling on an open market. And if you can keep that in mind, that's how you prosper. And that's what Richard Florida was trying to talk about. Thank you. Uh, good evening. Thank you all for coming. I thank our speaker again. He gave a nice presentation on uh, some architecture. Um, what I'd like to say, um, knowledge spreads. From in, back in Galileo's time, there was no no phone, no internet, no television, no radio. The only way you could learn something is by sitting down and having a cup of coffee or a cup of tea and talking to somebody. Knowledge spread from one person to another, and certain kinds of knowledge is spreading that way from one person to another in America today on the blacked out subjects where the press, as we've talked about for since I've been coming here in 2007, the press in America runs a two-pronged process. They promote the myth on all channels 24-7 and they simultaneously run a coordinated blackout on what I call Albert Einstein and 500 of his friends saying the earth isn't flat. Well, uh, we just saw tonight an example of a man who is <coughs> living uh, on one subject, he's in a complete bubble, but he feels completely comfortable coming up here and criticizing me for giving forensic facts that have been documented by tens of thousands of scientists. The reason I talk about 9-11 is because 9-11 is the cornerstone poisonous tree, the psychological tree that was planted deep in this country on September 11th. Uh, the gentleman that criticized me for my comments on 9-11 obviously hasn't cracked any one of Professor Griffin's 12 books or any of the other 30 or 40 books that I've digested from other scientists and university professors all over the planet. Professor Griffin in his last book said, you know, we have critical issues facing us, especially our military says that climate change and the flooding of Florida, Houston, catastrophic climate change that's approaching and getting worse is the number one threat to America now. It's not terrorism. But, as one other person up there said, the billionaires who own and operate the companies that sell machinery for war, that's breakables. If you sell refrigerators, people buy one and it lasts 15 or 20 years. But if you sell breakable things like bombs and missiles and all kinds of other stuff that gets used up and broken, you're constantly getting orders. And incidentally, um, uh, Smedley Butler wrote, the Marine General, you sell a pair of shoes to the uh, Macy's or Gimbel's, you might make 10 or 15 percent profit. If you sell the same pair of shoes or boots to the military, you make 5,000 percent profit. The markup is huge. And so this is why uh, the books we had last week showing war is a racket. It's highly profitable. It's the most profitable thing a lot of big corporations do, next to making a bottle of medical pills for $10 and selling it for $5,000. That's the trend in America. <laughs> or, uh, on many subjects, uh, uh, Professor Griffin had a friend out in California. He told him, David, you don't need an open mind to understand this. You need a 30% open mind and a 7th grade education. The hard part is stepping through the psychological barrier and looking at the evidence with an open mind. 30% open mind, that's all you need. Now, we're all on the same page here. I couldn't get a single hand raised. Nobody disagreed with me when I asked, who thinks the pedophile priests are doing a good job with our kids? We're all on the same page on that. But 20 years ago, a lot of people defended Father O'Malley because they didn't know he was abusing the kitchen. 
we're all on the same page about accepting smoke-free restaurants and smoke-free schools. Even though some people still smoke, they, you can't get into a fist fight in a restaurant anymore like asking people to put out, put out their cigarette. So uh, we have to be compassionate but consistent in helping people learn that you're living in a bubble. And if you're living in a bubble, continuing to promote the myth that we were attacked by Muslims on 9-11, you're complicit in the suppression of knowledge about the corporate criminals that financed and funded the myth that was sold to us like a Hollywood movie on 9-11. It was sold like a movie. And, and then 24-7, all channels, 19 Muslims got lucky. And then they began a coordinated blackout on all the scientists. Every kind of scientist you can think of, basically. Physical science, explosive experts, firemen, policemen. There's, there's a video that shows firefighters. Uh, when the video wasn't released until five years later because when they got back to the fire station, the survivors, their, their lives were threatened. They said, we can't protect your kids. If you speak out about the layers of explosive you watch growing off, as the three buildings, the three towers are brought down. All seven buildings were destroyed that day. They filmed the first two and sold it as a Muslim attack. It's a total myth. That's why Trump can get away with slaughtering people in Syria right now. Syria is next, and then Iran will ultimately be next. They'll find some justification. The military needs to take over the Middle East to keep it safe for the oil companies. It's all about oil and world domination. And if we don't do something as citizens, collectively, millions of us, then the kids that are in second, third grade right now, they have no future. When All the more reason to get thorium going. It's going to be a different plan. And as I said before, some people are still living in a bubble, thinking and not understanding that any kind of nuclear power is the single most expensive way on Earth to boil water. <laughs> That's Nuclear power can't hold a candle, pardon the expression, to the fusion reactor out there that dumps light on us. And you're wrong. Light and heat. So uh, help, help our less educated friends move forward so we all get on the same page like we are on uh, smoke-free buildings or uh, had a file priest at no debate. You got a question real quick? Yeah, yeah, just one quick question. Tell me, how do I get into bomb making business? You got to be a, a multi-millionaire or billionaire. Uh, ordinary people like us uh, can't get contracts to sell bombs to the military. That's for the rich contractors that are already entrenched and have been for years and years and years. So. Uh, that's where we are. Just and, buy some uh, preferred stock. You can learn a lot. If you, if those of you that haven't been logging on to Common Dreams every day, I can't stress it enough. That's the best progressive, non-political news site on the planet. Democrats, Republicans, they criticize both of them. They criticize anybody that's not doing things that are common sense that will help the nation move forward. That's why the name of that, okay. that website is Common right. Dreams. Common Dreams and Truth Out. Both of those okay. have massive knowledge. So thank you very much. And Charlie. Charlie will wrap it up, and then... We'll All right, Charlie. Up. All right. Yay! Let Peter go. All right, let's thank our speaker one last time. Thank you, man. Peter, to sit here and give a message. Tell us about your adventures in China and in, in Asia. I'll be collecting as usual here. Uh, I, I've heard this over and over. You're going to give me a ride home? Cool. I um, heard this over and over again, this media blackout, and I've been a webmaster since the internet had such things. I, my service is called Homestead because I was among the people that homesteaded the internet. I can go home and have been and put together any number of websites and do it for any number of organizations, not as a business, but uh, for those that I think are worthwhile and can benefit uh, from my services for free. I can do the same thing at Facebook. I maintain several sites. Uh, the other things, I've also been involved with people who, who, who use publishers and also engage in self-publishing uh, of books. Uh, worked with on various projects. Uh, I don't know where this media blackout is being affected. I don't know if anyone ever contacted me regarding the content of any of the things that I produce in print. I was a librarian for many, many years and never contacted by anyone with a list or prohibition of what literature could be on a public library show. 
but yet you maintain there's some media blackout. Well, who's affecting it? But maybe I've been eluded them and so forth. But anyhow, the burden of proof is on you, boys and girls. Anyhow, let's approach something else. Uh, why, oh, let me, why Johnny can't read interests me in particularly. Um, I was looking a little bit more, like how do different cultures approach the concept of a classroom? Uh, do you gather in a circle or do you have this military uh, instructor and, and audience thing uh, format here? Uh, I don't know what works best. I think, yeah, you generally listen to someone who speaks with authority, like all of you are doing right now. I think it's a good format. Yeah. <laughs> works for me. Uh, anyhow, some other things like ratio, I don't think come into play among the variables. Probably the, if you've got a homogeneous or heterogeneous uh, assembly of students, it's the student body that would determine uh, the, the structure of it. Um, giving uh, also some of the things, education itself differs among cultures. And of course the Asians, it's more of a remote activity probably doesn't need an instructor even in the first place because you're simply memorizing things, the essence of it. But uh, the other thing is uh, the, uh, the, um, this thing about the Western culture not having zero. Um, there are some guys called the pre-Socratic philosophers and they form the basis of the the very keystone of Western civilization, the pre-Socratic philosophers. Among those were a guy called Pythagoras. And I think you know that he had some association with mathematics. <laughs> Another guy that was very prominent was a gentleman called Archimedes. Uh, these gentlemen, the Greeks, were very... Eureka! Were, were, had, had, stellar achievements in mathematics. They had some issue about the zero representing nothingness. They certainly knew mathematics, established the core basis of it, and they didn't need anybody else to come along and teach them, you know, what numbers to use and things of that nature. But they, uh, uh, I hear this all the time, they debated whether or not, uh, and being Greeks, they didn't accept it. Being in nothingness, there's a book that's very popular, but uh, they looked into it, and yeah, they, they, had, they were very skillful mathematicians, and amazingly so for the period, just their achievements of measuring the size of the Earth, the Moon, and the, the structures they put together, such as the Parthenon. Anyhow, we had a good time. Thanks a lot. Okay. Hey, Peter. Right. Peter gets the last word. You guys listen to me. Okay. Yes, hey. Shut up. Thanks to uh, Charlie for yeah. giving us an update, and our speaker will give us the last word. And I'd just like to thank Charlie for showing us how it's possible to live in a bubble and ignore 50 books on blacked out subjects. As long as you never work on a blacked out subject, you're never going to be approached. You can go for years and years and not be talked to by them, as long as you never try to talk about one of those third rail subjects in print. That's my point. Thank you, Charlie. <laughs> All right, Peter, get the last word. We really took some long journeys around, <laughs> way around the world, further than I took you. But I, I'll just close with one of the doors I opened. One of the doors uh, had a room with no one there, but on the chalkboard, and it was still one of those old fashioned witchcraft sort of places that Dan was there. Um, you know, an old school situation with a chalkboard and on it it said integrity, um, sincerity, and endurance. And, and I realized it was either some sort of spirit that was in the room from a long time ago when they brought the chalkboard over to the U.S., or it was someone who had just finished a class and put that on the board. And what I mean is, those three principles are universal. 
So put the distractions aside and the witchcraft of some, some bad experiences we've had in public schools. And if students still go to class with the idea I must be sincere and I must have integrity to others in my class and uh, I will endure, um, then they've learned that lesson no matter where they've got it from. So that ghostly board that taught me a lot and I was glad I visited Pittsburgh that day. Let's keep those values in mind wherever we go, school or work, or just with friends. Thank you. Devil the South, Andy. Devil the South. Okay, one last announcement really quick. Uh, we got quite a crowd here tonight. If you'd all begin to move to the back so that Heather and the bus boys can clean this. They want to get us out of here by quarter of an hour. So if you want to uh, visit and talk to people, uh, go into the other room there, please. If you got ice cream or anything else, uh, take it with you. Thanks. And we're out. Okay, I'll still see you.